Okay, once again, welcome everyone to a virtual International Day of the Midwife. We are so pleased to have you all here and so pleased to be uh, part of this exciting presentation. I would like to take just a moment to, uh, to recognize and to uh, welcome our speaker, Patricia Ross. Patricia has over 30 years of experience as a teacher, trainer, and organizational development consultant. She managed these functions in Fortune 500 and nonprofit organizations. Patricia <laughs> education with the highest honors from the International School of Traditional Midwifery. She worked in the US and abroad to exceed requirements for clinical experience and earned the Certified Professional Midwife Credential. As Education Director of Midwives on a Mission of Service, a nonprofit agency which empowers birth attendants in Sierra Leone to provide maternity care and act as change agents, she developed the curricula and co-trained 500 students. She also taught midwives in Uganda and in the Philippine Islands. Trish revised Mom's Distance Learning Midwifery Program and administered it for three years. The Episcopal Church ordained Trish in 1995, and she has worked with people struggling with domestic violence, HIV, AIDS, and hunger. She has been on three nonprofit boards. Trish lives in Guajala, California with her spouse and dogs. The family includes five grown children and stepchildren and eight grandchildren. Welcome, Trish. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that I am calling in on a landline. So Nisa and I are working together closely. Um, and she's going to be feeding me a lot of information that I should be seeing, but I can't because of uh, some technical problems that I'm having. But I am very glad to be here. And Nisa, if you could show the next slide of uh, the gathering of people um, with their banners. And this was taken uh, a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now, at a jamboree. Every two years we host a jamboree and we gather all the women that we've trained and anyone else who wants to come. And we party and we have a lot of continuing education and a lot of network and problem solving. And we, I, I love these. I love this picture. I get, I get, I get real um, misty and dopey over over this work. Um, so you, I might choke up a couple of times. And the next slide gives you an overview of who we are and some of the things that I'm going to talk about this morning. Organizations and individuals um, who try to help other people can make a real mess of things, or they can do spectacularly well. And so one of the things that I want to do here is to share the things that we learned the hard way so you don't have to, and um, just point out some things that, that work in this kind of work. And so the next slide, you'll see a picture of two people. The person on the left is Chris McManus. She is our president, and she is an essential person in, during COVID. She's the editor of a newspaper, and she is at work today. Uh, couldn't get off because they have they are working on it with a skeleton crew. The person on the right is me laughing, um, and uh, I am Trish Ross, the education director of Moms. Next slide. Uh, you see a picture here of, of three of three groups of people, um, and these are the people that really make up Moms. Moms is Midwives on Missions of Service Moms. And um, these are the folks that really make this happen. Um, they are the heart of the program and the key to building the deep relationships that is our primary success factor um, for the work that we do. And next slide, you'll see a picture of um, some women. Um, this was taken last June. And it was a class of graduates. They passed. They attended every day of class, three and a half weeks, and they passed a rigorous exam with 70% or better uh, to graduate. And um, they are illiterate. Two of these women could actually read and write at about a third or fourth grade level. Um, they are intelligent and they are highly motivated. And the next slide. A lot of people don't know where Sierra Leone is, and so we're looking at West Africa. You see a little green country that I have circled um, there. That's that's home, um, and um, most people know C 
Sierra Leone for the Blood Diamond War and the Ebola epidemic that raged across West Africa uh, a few years ago. Next slide. Uh, this is Sierra Leone. We work primarily in the southeast section. That little uh, yellow county called Kailaun was where we started out, and then we have been moving east and south, and we hope to move north um, from here in the next in the next two years, we actually have a plan for, for moving north. So the next slide. Um, this is the southeast portion of the country, and you see dots um, across, scattered across the countryside. These are the sites where we have trained. The size of the dot indicates um, how many people in that area we have trained. You see a ring around a little town called Bo. That's actually the last, second largest city in Sierra Leone and that's where our headquarters is. Um, so we use that as a jumping off point. To give you a little uh, sense of perspective, uh, just way south of Bo, the big, big dot at the south corner of the country, uh, that's a town called Jendema. And it took us uh, 14 hours to drive that. It's about 150 miles. So the, the roads are bad. And the next picture shows you um, why it takes so long <laughs> to get anywhere. Um, this is a road. Um, I've driven this road a whole bunch of times. Um, I have had flat tires. I've had bridges collapse. Um, I killed a chicken um, once. And uh, it's just that it's beautiful, um, but it's, it's rural. It's remote. And the next picture, you see um, this, this is the village, the first village that we went to to do our needs assessment and the first village where we did our training. This is a little larger village than usual for the rainforest. It's got about 750 to 800 people in it. But it looks typical. You see the thatched roof or the um, corrugated metal roof, um, mud brick walls, um, and that's that's... That's kind of our home there. Um, I, I'm very fond of this place. Uh, next slide shows you our first classroom. This is a typical classroom for us with a thatched roof and the open air sides. This kind of building is called a bari, and I might, I might use that name when I talk about different things, that, but that's a bari. And we had 62 people. Uh, we had told them we would work with 30 and 62 showed up, and it was a mess. Um, it was really, really hard to try to teach 62 people in this, in this place, but we managed. And we got really rigorous about the first 35 people and no more because that just didn't work. Um, one more slide, Nisa, and you'll see some numbers. Um, Uh, the maternal mortality, uh, you can see that between 2007 and 2017, there's been a, a significant improvement um, by half. Uh, um, and, that's, and that's great. And then you can see the United States statistics as, as a reference. So when we arrived in Sierra Leone in 2006, um, the rural areas where we were, that little town of Pelly, um, there had been about 50 births, and 10 women had died. And, um, and that's not uncommon for the rural areas. The rural areas have the higher mortality. Um, now, um, that very same village, um, there were 60 women who gave birth in 2019, and um, none died. And uh, so we're, we're really proud of the, the changes that have occurred there. Um, and you can see the rest of those statistics. I'm not going to read them to you. Next page. Um, when we talk about developed nations, developing nations, undeveloped nations, Sierra Leone usually ranks in the bottom three of... Um, being an undeveloped nation, and um, it also has the 
it's in the bottom three of maternal mortality, childhood mortality, and all, all of these numbers. Um, but this gives you an idea of what we're talking about in terms of money. Um, I'm really upset about this number of MDs. Uh, in 2007, there were 97. Ten years later, there were 150. Today, there's at least one fewer. Um, a good friend of ours uh, died yesterday of COVID-19. Um, and I'm grieving him deeply. But we found, um, we find that the local birth attendants are ubiquitous, trusted, and highly motivated. And so when we did our needs assessment in 2006, it was like, hey, we've got some really bright, motivated people here that the community trusts, and they're all over the place. Why not leverage them? Why, why round up women and force them to go to birth waiting houses? Why, why uh, force them to go to town? Why, why do all of this enforced travel of the pregnant woman when you have a fabulous resource right here at hand? Um, do something. To, let's, let's use them. And the government said, no, you don't understand. Um, and we said, well, let us try. And they agreed to let us try. And we developed our vision and goals here. Uh, next slide, um, Nisa. Um, many organizations have very similar goals. Women will have access to birth attendants and related health care services. The birth attendants will provide health care and lives are going to improve. But what makes us different are, are these uh, adjectives and these verbs that I've italicized. We, we aim at the women with the fewest choices. And we want to make sure that they have ready access to well-trained birth attendants, not that they're being forced to leave their homes for six weeks to go to a birth waiting house um, and that um, all, all the stuff that goes along with that. Um, so it's, it's these italicized words that we are training the birth attendants to, um, we're training them well, and they're providing excellent care, and they are partnering with the healthcare system to make sustainable change. And to make that sustainable change, we use a development model rather than a relief model. So that's my intro. Um, uh, next slide, Nisa. And um, if anyone's been asking questions um, about who we are, where we are, um, I'd be glad to entertain those. Otherwise, I'll go on um, to the next slide and talk about what mom's model actually is. And um, our model is based on the, our values, and our standard is excellence. And the underpinning of it all is, is uh, partnership. So the next page, I'm starting with values. Um, and notice that our values are not a list of nouns. Uh, we don't value partnership. Our value is insisting on a partnership. We don't value capacity resilience. We value developing capacity resilience. And this moves us from sitting around um, pontificating about what we want to do to actually do it. We insist on partnership. We develop capacity. We exercise the self-control it takes to stick to our values. And sometimes that can be really hard. And we deliver on the promise of excellence. Next page. Um, we started out with, prepare, with the idea that we were going to train women to be birth attendants. And so we started there at the left with training community health workers. That's what CHW stands for, community health worker. And we found that they don't get paid for what they do. So if they're working in the clinic or if they're teaching uh, childbirth education classes or providing postnatal care in the village, uh, they're not getting paid and they're not working in their farm. And they're uh, subsistence farmers. So if they're not working in the farm, the weeds and the rats are, are getting their crop, and that's not a good thing. So we decided to help with creating, um, giving them seed money to form a small business. We, we talked to them about a business plan, 
and uh, we give them uh, a startup grant for a small business. Most of them are doing savings and loans. Uh, some are doing farms, have, have created small, uh, mostly peanut farms or rice. Um, and some are doing some other uh, things that have a small uh, used clothing business. And this is how they support themselves, um, support their families, and uh, actually provide support to the community. They use the proceeds of the business to help buy gloves for the clinic or to help a woman who needs uh, to be transported to uh, a different town for higher level of care. Um, and uh, where, where we work, uh, the ambulances can't get there, so they will ride a, a, a motorcycle. And so we pay the, this gives them a little bit of money to give the motorcycle driver to pay him to take the woman to the nearest hospital. Um, with structuring these little businesses like this, um, they, cr they elected leaders, um, and we found that pulling the leaders together of the different communities where we work was fabulous because these are the women that, that the women that we've trained respect. They're respected in the community, and we were leaving a whole lot of leadership on the table um, if, if we wouldn't pay attention to these women and develop them. So we've continued to develop them. Um, they are point persons in the community. They meet with each other to set strategy and to solve problems and to tell us wh where we're screwing up. So they're great. Uh, and then we've also got uh, professionally developed staff and trainers uh, because we're taking this notion of independence very seriously. And if we're going to, if they're going to be moms, they need to know how to be moms and, and again to avoid the mistakes. So we have invested time in them, sending them to school um, and developing our staff and trainers. And all of this, it just falls down like, like any house would. Um, it'll fall down without the foundation of relationships. Next page. So I've just quickly listed the success factors. Um, our values, the, the um, basis on relationship, the fact that these four programs are closely intertwined. And then another success factor is the professionality of our curriculum and testing. And then as uh, one, our value of, of self-control. Uh, I pulled that out separately because it just it's so important and we've seen so many other agencies uh, crash and burn. Um, and I'll talk about that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, next page. Um, the values, um, again, are verbs. And this is where the self-control comes in. Having certain values means that we have to say no. Because we are uh, emphasizing development over relief, we have to say no to lots of money actually. There are people, there are a lot of grants for relief work. There are very few grants for development work. Um, me, means that I say no to a lot of people who want to volunteer. And they want to volunteer to uh, preach the gospel, perhaps. Uh, they want to get their, uh, their students wanting to get their numbers. Um, they are midwives wanting to get more skills and they see mom's work as a as a as a venue for that, and we no we're we're not doing that. Uh, our beneficiaries are the women of Sierra Leone, not student midwives around the world, uh, but particularly in the United States because that's where I am. Um, midwives wanting more skill, you know, nice, you need it just as the students need to get their experience. But that's not our mission. That's not our values. That's not our work to do. So that means we have to say no. And I don't, always, I don't like saying no to people. So there are times when it's, when it's really tough to say no, but, but we do that. Next page, relationships. Here I like, I like this picture so much. Um, this is, we, we dance. We dance all the time. 
um, with the women, and they've taught us many of their songs. And so we sing and we dance. Um, and here you see Chris. Um, this is a song um, and dance about you are teaching us so much, you've stuffed our head full, and now we have he- a headache. And it's just it's just a fun song. And um, usually they'll jump up and start uh, dancing and singing uh, when we've taught them something that's particularly new or something about something that's been particularly puzzling for them. Um, but we we go in, we, we live for a month with, with these folks, and we eat with them, uh, we sleep with them. Um, we're always white women with an American passport. You know, that just, that just is. But we connect uh, on many other ways, uh, many other levels as women, uh, as mothers, as uh, battered wives, um, as people who have been poor. Um, so it's, it's pretty wonderful, the relationships that we build. Next page. These are those four programs again. Um, and they, all, they all weave back and forth. Um, and I'll just skip over that. I think that's fairly obvious. Um, so next slide. This is about the mom CHWs. And so the, the community health worker role has four pillars. And they're the bridge between the people and the clinics. They provide evidence-based maternity care. They teach the community um, all kinds of things about um, uh, nutrition, hydration, sexually transmitted diseases, uh, breast health, breast self-exams, childbirth education, um, all kinds of things. You name it, they teach it. And they solve problems, both at, at a the level of their neighbors, but also um, larger level problems with um, not having, um, uh, with with the farmers selling the best produce down t- t- down the road to in in the larger city, and where um, the people of the village are left only with the with white rice to eat for for weeks at a time. You know, that's an economic problem, and, and the women have approached um, the village elders in, in several places to talk about how they can do this differently so that especially the pregnant women and children have, a better, sor- have better sources of nutrition, have, have better options for eating. Uh, another problem that many have focused on is domestic violence and gender-based violence. And uh, in one particular village, they've went to the local police force and talked with them about um, how to work together to reduce uh, gender-based violence in their community. There's five characteristics that we teach them, and we weave these five things throughout the the modules with the the hard knowledge. Um, And probably the most important is uh, being a role model, and we hammer on that one. Next page. We have a 400-page curriculum, and it's lesson plans, the test resources, administrative stuff, um, and the trainer guide, how how to train the material. Um, We have it. Our curriculum is professional. When Nisa introduced me, she mentioned that I've got more than 30 years in a career in instructional design training, organizational development, change management, all of that kind of stuff. And I pulled in some of my former employees and colleagues, and and we have um, a curriculum that would would win awards. Uh, I've won awards on, on curricula that I've built in the past. Um, and you know, I, I know the quality of this, and um, it's good. We we brought in several people to help us with it, as well as subject matter experts, to make sure that the content is precise. And we revise the the material at least once a year, usually twice, to make sure that everything is current in it. Um, most of us have had experiences in having terrible teachers. Uh, or sitting through bad classes, I you know I think about my college and um, midwifery school as well as um, high school. Uh, you know, it's not as easy to teach. Otherwise, we would have 
more memories of great teachers instead of just that one or two or three um, in our history of having maybe 40 or 50 teachers. Next page. So our lesson plans, uh, our content is pretty much general midwifery types of content uh, from general health and anatomy and physiology through maternity care uh, and women's health. And then we also have um, a section on change agency, uh, how, how to solve problems, systematic approaches to identifying problems, prioritizing them, uh, prioritizing um, assessments, and uh, focusing on what to do first, and then to um, actually create a plan um, for solving problems and monitoring and evaluating the work. So it's, it's a comprehensive uh, change program. Next page. And here you see us teaching anatomy, or this is actually fetal development. Um, and we are in a BARI, an open air building. This one is, um, actually has um, concrete slip over the mud brick, um, which is beginning to fade. Um, and there is a big hole in the roof, and we got rained on more than once. Um, when we taught this class. This was last year. But again, we're, our learner population is um, illiterate, and so they've never seen pictures like these. So these are definitely worth a 1,000 or 10,000 words. Next page. And here you see them. I walked in the room to take this picture, and they're going, oh, please help us, please help us. And no, I'm not going to. Um, here they were getting ready to organize themselves um, to um, to form their group um, to figure out how they were going to work together. And it was harder than they thought, but they did. They did a beautiful job. They're a great group of people. Next page, our results. We've trained 500 community health workers. We've certified three trainers. And you can see our other things. And the best result and the hardest result is that we have a waiting list of communities that's uh, about four years out. And so um, we're wanting to train more trainers so that they can work more independently and keep this thing running uh, and growing. So um, do you have any questions about that? Next page. I'm I'm sorry, Nisa. I'm for, I'm I'm afraid I'm forgetting to tell you. I'm trying to be good. Do you have any questions about what our program is? Okay, let's go on to the next page. And this is where I'm trying to really distill some things down. Um, and here, I love this picture. This is Carol. Um, the white woman is is. Uh, Carol Nelson from Minneapolis, and uh, we are working uh, to do the practicum in a uh, in our class, and we were teaching Carol how to teach. Uh, she is with an agency called Rural Healthcare Initiative, and we partner with several agencies like this. Uh, our HCI's model is very different. They are de they are going deep into one area, and they're doing all kinds of things in this one area, uh, supporting their clinic in many ways. We have full permission of this client to have her picture made. As a matter of fact, she went through the line four times to be um, to be a model for us and wanted us to take pictures of her each time. The woman um, who is learning how to palpate her belly is um, named Fatima and Fatima Bangura, and she's um, a really good egg. Next page. We have to navigate all these challenges, um, and I think every organization, an individual trying to help others, has to has to face them. Um, patriarchalism and institutionalism um, is just a royal pain, and we came up against that that first that first time we tried to talk to them, and we told them what we had found in our needs assessment, and. And the government of Sierra Leone said, no, these women are ignorant, they're dirty, they're the problem. Um, you, 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 no, you, no. And so we begged and pleaded and cajoled and um, got them to let us do a, a pilot, and the pilot was successful. 
We weren't surprised how successful it was, but they were. And that was the start of mom's work in Sierra Leone. But they just knew that um, these women couldn't do this kind of work. And um, we proved them wrong, and I'm glad we did. So next page. Um, these are the easy lessons that we learned uh, and that we knew from our experiences in other agencies and in other places. Um, and I think I want, I want to talk just a minute about the prioritizing our values to simplify decision-making. And different agencies have different values, okay? Some agencies have a high value on religion and on proselytizing. But what they need to do, and we, and we see this a lot, um, what they need to do is really be honest about that and pr name that as a priority. And so um, everybody knows what they're doing because their choice of teachers is different than our choice of teachers because they're, they're choosing teachers... Um, because their ideology is so important to them, their ideology about religion is so important to them, they choose re teachers with the right religious background. Um, and we, we don't. Uh, we, we don't, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm ordained, and uh, I care deeply about my faith, but I don't, my faith does not drive my choice of teachers. I want an excellent teacher not necessarily a teacher who is an Episcopalian or a Christian or <coughs> anything else. Um, our board of directors has uh, atheists, Christians, Jews. Uh, we no longer have a Buddhist, and we no longer have a Hindu, and we no longer have a Muslim. And so um, we're hoping that um, at some point or another uh, we might diversify further again. But we've had... We've had various folks on there. But that's, um, and then that last one, acting respectfully, respectfully of the laws of all jurisdictions. We see a lot of uh, midwifery organizations crash on this one. Uh, they don't want to follow the laws, and they don't, and they cause problems. And we've had midwives, actually, that have served in our same area who disobeyed the laws, and people came to us to try to tell us to not let her come and work. And, you know, we, we can't do that. But um, that's the kind of thing that, that really, it's, it sounds logical and sensible, but people don't do it, and it causes all kinds of problems. Next page, ugly lessons. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. I remember my mother telling me that when I was a little girl. And boy, oh boy. I have seen that time and again, and I catch myself saying, but I didn't mean that. Well, yeah. <laughs> I may not have meant that outcome, but my, my intention is irrelevant. What happened, happened. And I allowed it to happen through my own ignorance or my own... Um, naivete or uh, just just not knowing, not listening to good advice, not asking for good advice, um, letting my intentions drive um, my decision making. And this notion of creating dependence is easy and has terrible repercussions. We see that a lot with uh, people who take supplies places. I know a woman who did a tour of Africa and saw she was a school teacher and she saw teachers teaching without paper and pencils. So she arranged to send a container of paper and pencils to this place. And the teachers went through it and then turned to her and said, "Well, we're out of paper and pencils." And she called me up all in a panic about how these people were taking advantage of her. And it's like, no, 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 no. They're not taking advantage of you. You set yourself up to be a, a supply chain and you created dependence. And it's easy to do. And you could, she certainly didn't intend to do it, but that was the result. 
and it reinforces the notion of people having to look at outsiders and other people um, for support when instead of finding internal solutions that that work better, work um, more effectively. But she couldn't imagine teaching a class without paper and pencils. And her imagination um, and lack of imagination um, caused a problem in a, in a community, and, and that's that's hard. Next page. Um, so, any questions? This is this is <coughs> your chance to say, Trish. That sounds nice, but really. Are you dead? Trish, is this the um, the end of the um, presentation? Because I have a few questions, but I didn't uh, I didn't want to interrupt if you still have more. <coughs> yeah, no, uh, this is this is the time for you to ask. If you want to flip forward to uh, the contacts page, I think it's two more pages. Um, that's yes. how how people can get a hold of me if they want to ask questions offline. Um, but ask questions now. Okay, so Becky asks, do you do ongoing training for your trainers? Yes, we do. Uh, we, uh, every time I, I, go, I go to Sierra Leone twice a year and sit with them and do updates on content and have them practice uh, their training skills with me. They also meet <coughs> every other month uh, themselves and go over the material to deepen their understanding and to uh, keep really current on their skills. So I was curious about whether <coughs> there are things that, um, that other midwives, midwives around the world, midwives in this, in this room right now, are there things that we can do to support you and the work that you're doing? Because I find it really impressive. And would like oh, we always take money. <laughs> um. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know that that that's um, that's always a big need. Um, we do not take a lot of volunteers to teach with us because we go to these tiny little villages where um, you know a team of more than you know two or three or four people would just overwhelm the village. Um, but if somebody wants to send us copies of a book for midwives, they have a new edition out, and I'm wanting to get them. We leave a copy of that at every place that we that we teach. Um, and if uh, somebody would t uh, like to have, if you have instruments that you don't use anymore, uh, we take those and leave those at the clinics where we, where we teach. Um, we don't want to become part of the supply chain, but they don't have good instruments. So we, we try to balance that, uh, you know, some gifts. One time we position it as a one-time gift for when we come and teach. Um, so take care of these things. And um, so if people want to, to send us stuff to take over, we will take um, those kinds of supplies. We'll take copies of the book for midwives. Uh, we'll take money. And if you really want to volunteer, get in touch with me, and, and I can and start putting you through, through that process. Or if you're interested in being on our board, get in touch with me. We have lots of comments in the chat box, and I've taken pictures of lots of those for you to send to you for later. Uh, but lots yeah. of people saying things like, thanks, and you're doing a fantastic job, and thank you, this was inspiring. Um, and I think anyone who read your results slide would absolutely find it inspiring. Oh, good. So, so well, we just... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just wanted to know how you first got involved. What, um, what led you this direction? Your, it sounds like your life has taken many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was 53 years old, my daughter had a baby at home with a midwife. And I told my wife, um, you know, if I had it to do all over again, I would grow up and be a midwife. And she said, well, you're not dead yet. Um, so I started midwifery school and we had both, we had met in seminary and we both had this desire to to do something. And we were both working with people with HIV AIDS at the time. This was in the early 90s. And um, and so we knew we wanted to do something like this. So I started midwifery school, and we found out what 
you know, what the global needs of women were. And it was like, you know, we need to be doing something about this. We've got the skills. We've got the resources. Let's do something. So we we got in touch with some people and started, uh, we went to Senegal. Uh, and it was a wonderful experience, but it wasn't a model that worked for us. And so we thought, what are we going to do? And then we got a phone call from a woman who said, will you go to Sierra Leone and teach midwives? And we said, no, we'll go there and we'll do a needs assessment. And uh, we went to this little village of Pelly and did our needs assessment and our first class there, and it's grown from that. So, I mean, this is definitely a case of, you know, we've been figuring things out as we've been doing it. Well, that is exciting and wonderful, and I think probably exactly how the direction that that is supposed to happen. Yeah. So, um, again, thank you so much for that presentation. It was um, really, I think the the words of our participants are, are probably the best words. It was just really inspiring to see someone identify a need and then and then all the effort that you've thrown into making a difference. Well, thank you very much. That feels good. It, it was really weird to, to do this over the phone and to not have any feedback, you know, I, I, you know, there were a couple of times when I felt like saying, you know, is anybody out there? (laughs) (laughs) We were here and listening. uh, Oh, good, good, good. Thank you. And please uh, contact me. Send send me, the best way to reach me is actually email um, or, or the phone number. The 1707 phone number is, is my home phone. My cell phone doesn't work up here. We're in this little tiny corner of Northern California. That's, hard to get to. Um, but uh, follow us on Facebook, send me um, emails, and uh, talk with me. I love to talk with people. I love to listen to your ideas. <laughs>